Hi, everybody. I will try to be quick, because I know we're trying to make up a little bit of time, but my name is Greg Orton. I'm the National Director of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans. And so just listening to all of you today, I had a presentation. I'm going to scrap it a little bit and change it up a little bit. To begin with, I'll tell you what is NCAPA, because many of you may not be as familiar with the national landscape of the API community. The National Council of Asian Pacific Americans is a coalition of 34 national API organizations that work together to represent all of our communities at the national level. We, uh, we've heard a lot of talk about wanting to bring all of our diverse communities together. Well, NCAPA has done that. We have members that represent East Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities, and we're all working together to elevate our voices to be heard in Congress. Now, our, and CAPA draws its strength directly from its members. Uh, the collective networks of all our individual members, two of whom are here today, Jason and Christine are both members of NCAPA, uh, their collective networks span across all across the country and into three territories. We speak multiple languages and we work directly in those communities. Now, <clears throat> structurally, NCAPA has five policy committees that we purposely mirrored uh, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Um, we have health, housing, economic justice, civil rights, immigration, education. Now, again, the reason we structured this to mirror KPAC is because our, the members of our committees work directly with the staffs as members of KPAC on a regular basis, working to make sure that the policies that Congress pursues, obviously, as of late, it's been, there's been fewer opportunities based on the way Congress looks, but always striving to basically make sure that the API voice is heard in policy debates. Now, this is where I'm going to stop and sort of shift gears in terms of what my original script was. Now, this is who we are, but why am I here? Because I actually just got to know Sandy and Anthony at Civic Leadership USA very recently, and I'm very grateful for that and grateful for the invitation to be here. Now, listening to all of you, one thing that has always struck me about our community is that we're very good when it comes to getting our ground, ground game, turning people out, getting our community engaged at the local level. But when it comes to the longer game of policy change and actually changing things at the national level, we're still learning, finding our way, finding our voice. And the real question is, how do we sort of take the lessons learned at the local level, kind of reflecting all the great work that all of you have done, whether it's in Florida or Ohio or Silicon Valley or the Bay Area, and applying that and actually starting to use that to leverage that at the national level. Now, a couple of days ago, NCAPA had its annual retreat. We had 22 organizations in DC. Many members flew out to DC to sit, talk, and get real about the issues we face. And for me, it was great because I've been on the job for a year. Previously, I was on the Hill for 10 years. I was chief of staff for Congressman Al Green from Houston, Texas. And one of the things that I'm most proud of about our retreat is we made a definitive decision to focus on 2020 because we all recognize how important that year is. And I know all of you do too. We've heard about the census. We know about the presidential election. Um, on the previous slide I showed you, there were five policy committees. The members of NCAPA voted to create a civic engagement committee, which is why I think the timing of this is perfect. We recognize the fact that in addition to the policy infrastructure that we've already created, we have a responsibility to make sure that we're coordinating on the civic engagement side as well. API vote, Christine, and the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, uh, basically we sat, I sat down with the two of those organizations. We figured out what we wanted to do with that. And again, the recognition is just there's far too much at stake in 2020 for us to not be better mobilized. I think if we talked about social media, if everyone looked at their social media in the run-up to the 2018 election, there was a ton of content. And there was a ton of messages saying, GOTV, you know, you have to vote. But in my mind, it's about how do we make a singular message that unifies all of us, right? Because I think all of our work is about reaching as many people in our community as possible. And when you look at social media, it's kind of this chaotic mess. What if we were to land on a singular message that all of us could get behind and create a space where suddenly that same message is repeated over and over and we start touching people in the community that aren't as politically engaged because they start to see it more and more from multiple sources. That's ultimately what I envision when I'm thinking about civic engagement for 2020. Now, I'll close in saying this. I think, again, recognizing the power that you all have in your local communities and CAPA is, stands here ready and prepared to work with you all to provide the policy expertise at the national level as you engage with local communities, but also recognizing that as we focus on civic engagement, I look forward to getting to know all of you and working with you. Now, I know I have to wrap up. There's one thing I wanted to add on to Sandy and Christine's point earlier about the census. It is in 2020, 
And Sandy mentioned that to be undercounted is to be underrepresented. And we all know that phrase, but I want to make sure we all understand what that actually means. The census, when we get counted, actually determines congressional seats. So if we're undercounted, there's fewer congressional seats. If our community isn't recognized, the people who are elected are going to look at those numbers and say, well, I have 20,000 APIs in my district. That's a small number, not enough to get me reelected. If we get properly counted and make that 20,000 number an accurate reflection of, say, 60,000, that calculus that a member of Congress does and their staff, speaking from personal experience, completely changes. And so that is why it's really important to make sure that the messaging we get out there for the census is saying we have to be counted. I know there's a lot of fear and disinformation, but it is so important because also we only get one shot every 10 years. There's no redos on this thing. You know, I think we really have to make sure we get it right. So thank you for the extra time and thank you all. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Next.